So, uh, Sam Lee, thank you for coming to the Songwriter Series. Uh, this is uh, a series which has been a venture for me as well. I've been travelling into different uh, musical realms and different genres through the guest artist. And we're exploring song, purveying song, writing song. Um, so I'm going to start with a question I start with everybody, which is, uh, could you give us a little bit of a background to your musical history? Yeah, indeed. Thanks, Ravi. Um, I was brought up in a family with lots of music in it. My father uh, plays guitar, man of the jazz. Uh, my mother, though not a player herself, was a great lover of classical music and had a very encyclopedic knowledge of her opera and classical realms. And and it was a, f a house filled with lots of music, lots of singing with dad playing the guitar to us as kids. And always music playing, and I, yeah, I, I sort of didn't, don't think I had an exceptional youth in terms of the music I was introduced to. It was pretty standard songbook stuff of, you know, Beatles, Simon Garfunkel, a bit of Carpenters, you know, um, things of, 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 of um, all variety, a bit of jazz and easy listening and stuff, and but um, my dad was a, was a gifted sort of understander of music and, and had a very good pair of ears. And I think he inherited me that um, ability to listen deeply mm. and to be quite critical of music as well. He was a great music critic. He is a great music critic mm. of my music, first and foremost. <laughs> but um, we won't go into that <laughs> too yeah. early on in the conversation. Yeah. So yeah, lots of, lots of music. And then I went off into realm and it was really only about aged 16 or 17 that I sort of emerged out of a, a sort of pop fandom particularly massive fan of Michael Jackson who was my great great hero for much of my years and then it suddenly transferred to Joni Mitchell who exploded me out into many other parts of the musical world and then I became a big record song collector record collector and would play DJ and music nights and that sort of thing. And I was a real kind of forager for, for old secondhand vinyl and interesting stuff. So um, it was a kind of strange diet growing up musically. And eventually you came to, for want of a better term, folk music? Mm. There isn't a better term yet. Well, maybe traditional music actually in some ways, but then folk music firstly because... I came to it through growing up in an organisation called Forest School Camps, which took me and my sisters were sent out camping on in the summers mm. and got very connected to a community of wonderful people who've been going for what well, it's been going for seventy five years. Mm. Strong campfire singing tradition and in there was a repertoire of a lot of songs that mm. I didn't hear elsewhere. You know, yes, there was the the sort of uh Pete Seeger, the sort of rebellion songbook of mm protest songs, it was a very activist inclined organisation but then there was a lot of folk music traditional folk song, American and traditional British folk song which were songs I hadn't come across elsewhere and didn't really think much of them and what their progeny was because one didn't kind of question that sort of thing um, but then in my 20s, early 20s when the internet was coming around and getting more powerful uh, I started to look into where some of those songs that we None of my, you know, friends in their twenties outside of this organisation had ever heard of these songs or knew anything about them, and that led me into discovering the kind of roots of traditional British folk song. Mm -hmm. But in terms of your own musical, did you have any kind of musical training or anything like that? I did a little bit of piano lessons, which I was, which I sort of gave up for lack of interest. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really that keen on learning classical pieces or learning mm. scales. Mm. Mm. Um, though it turned out that my piano teacher was actually a massive English folk fan. Mm. Uh, and when he discovered I was a recording albums, we I realised that this man who could probably show me so much mm. about folk music, we never connected at that mm. level. So um, uh, no, no musical training at all. Singing, just singing with the camps, with my mm. friends mm. round the campfire. That was it, but it was always chorus, never solo song. There was no solo music in that in that sense, which is the absolute reverse of British folk song, which is entirely solo unaccompanied. 
almost religiously, um, historically. So I went for a big shift to going from like the communal round the fire chorus singing and harmony, all made up, you know, you just kind of learn round the fire to a very, a very lonely art form of the a cappella singer. Um, I didn't know that actually. In the the traditionally in the within the English folk mm-hmm. culture, the it's 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 all about solo singing. Totally, and the instrumentation and the tunes were were played separately. Never should the twain meet. Mm. So singers were never accompanied by an instrument. It was very strict separation, which is unlike anywhere else really, kind of in Europe. In that, so strictly for an entire nation. Different to. Um, Scotland, Ireland, Wales? No, all the same. Mm. Yeah. Um, our traditional song um, has always been one one singer, one one song, one voice, one song. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There are a couple of exceptions to that. The family of Sussex, not very far from here, mm. in Rottingdean, the Copper family, who've mm. been singing in harmony since the 1600s, mm. still are today. Mm with their wonderful songs, which maybe we'll sing one soon. Um, they are harmony singers, but they've created this family thing. And there was instances documented in the 1940s or 50s of some sisters singing in unison. But other than that, every bit of documented singing has been one one singer on their own mm. with no instrumentation. And then eventually you you went deeper into the, the traditional world. Uh, how did that mm. happen? Well... As I, as I sort of threw myself down the well of folk music, starting to learn songs, I wasn't interested in learning them from recordings made in the 19... Uh, uh, by contemporary folk revival singers, you know, your, your standard names from Steel Ice Span, Martin Carthy, Albion Band, a lot of those bands and musicians that were singing songs as revivalists. I kind of didn't appeal to me. I didn't really care... F- it didn't interest me. Um, and I didn't know why, but I knew that when I was hearing the voices of the source singers, as we call them, the farmers and plough hands and sailors and gypsies and travellers and milkmaids and, you know, the, the mm. kind of working class people and those recordings that were made from, like, you know, from 1906, from the first wax cylinder recordings, into reel to reel through the 1940s, 50s, into tape, um, 60s and 70s. Those recordings are those you know, salt of the earth, real folk of this land, singing not for a re- record deal, but because somebody had come up and said, do you know any songs? And they were like, yep, these are songs I know, these are songs I grew up with, mm. my mum and dad sang, and my mm. grandparents sang, mm. and so on and so forth. The, the, coming out of the old tradition, um, those voices and that way of singing and that, it's a dangerous words, but the kind of purity of them and the authenticity of them, mm which we could go into another time, it was so apparent Mm. that I was blown away by what the purpose of these songs were for. And it suddenly changed my my whole relationship to what songs were. They're not means to become famous and rich. They're a sort of a different practice. There's something very different, yet there's also ornamentation and an amazing amount of skill. And the melodic variety is really extraordinary and these songs are beautiful narratives. So I was just like, I had to learn as many as I could. I just learned and learned and learned songs. So would you say that there's a more practical aspect to it as opposed to, like you say, becoming rich and famous, like singing pop songs? That's pretty practical. <laughs> In fact, they're probably less practical. <laughs> they're there purely for, for the entertainment. That that's what we did. We sang, we had nothing else. We had no radios, no jukeboxes, no televisions. People gathered together and they sang folk songs. And they told stories and they spun yarns, but that was the music. Cause our well, was, was there an aspect of passing on knowledge as well, though, in, mm. in, in, ter- in, in terms of through the stories? And uh, uh, Yes, it's, it's kind of implicit that that's what happens. They get passed on. The young man turns up to the pub, the young girl turns up to the pub, hears those songs, learns them, because they hear the same songs every night. Eventually that old boy dies, and his song suddenly becomes everyone else's song. Mm. And so it carries on down the generations or you hear your mother or grandparents singing it around the house. Mm. And um, it's, and in that sense, that relationship to song of how they lived inside people really captivated me because there was something more 
uh, there was something more intense, more singular, something more sacred about that. Um, and I needed to have those songs inside me to understand what they meant, what the singing of them meant, what it was for, mm. which was a complex thing because I didn't want to be a musician. It was not my, never my plan. Um, but I was suddenly taken by this act, like by a, by a, by a, some, an offering that was to be made that I realised was very special and very few people of my age were learning these songs. Mm. And those who did had grown up with it because their parents were in the revival. Mm. Very few people were coming from the outside who were discovering it by accident mm. because you couldn't really hear it anywhere. It wasn't on radio, you didn't have a YouTube or Spotify or anything like that. It's all widely available. He lived in the library and then the few kind of mini record labels that were putting out these, you know, 100 pressings of a mm. strange old folk mm. singer. Mm. So they were not to be found, luckily, because I lived in Kentish Town. You were not not far from Cecil Shell Palace as well. Yeah. Did you go to Cecil Shell? I Shell? did indeed. Yeah. You know that was my first places to go, yeah. and it was kind of crazy, like finding this place that was devoted yeah. to this tradition. Yeah. Yet at the same time, it was also a little bit of a mausoleum, <laughs> and yeah, the library yeah, yeah. was fabulous. Yeah. Yeah, 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 the library was incredible. And Malcolm Taylor, the librarian there, kind of you know, like many of the people who came in, took me under the wing. I volunteered, and I started working in the archives, mm. and eventually I got a job there. Mm started running events and it was you know the place was mothballed and nothing happening mm. folk had pretty much mm. gone underground mm. and extinct and mm. there was no funding for it it was mm. just a sort of it was a dinosaur museum mm. it was incredible and I was this like young sort of hot headed upstart that wanted to come in and do loads of stuff mm. and, I, and I did I had a great time mm. working there and mm. then realised I was better served trying to do things elsewhere and moved on but not without learning a lot of their songs and uh, the songs and getting into the archives in a way that was quite privileged because I could listen to everything that had ever been recorded mm. from 1906 onwards. Mm. It was all there and I heard it all and I got to know every folk song and the sound recordings. Sound I mean, recordings. I, I can relate to it in terms of uh, when I was uh, my last year in Manchester, uh, I was living in Moss Side and I would go up to the Manchester University Library mm. uh, and just get like field recordings out and actually that was a turning mm. point for me because I would get field recording out let's say of you know Amazonian music right. wow. and then I realised years years later uh, that that was a turning point because like you say there was that purity that yeah. came through on these field recording records uh, that where it's the, the music is medicine yeah and it's, it's that purity is the same with that you know you would have found in these these field recordings so as well. In a funny way, it's a, I'm a bit more like that actually than I than might have said because I was listening to a lot of the Smithsonian Folkways mm. records from <clears throat> my early twenties of you know Inuit, uh, yeah, Central American mm. traditional, mm. a lot of ethnographic stuff, mm. Burundi drummers, you know the um, Olantanju, all these kind of amazing carries of. Of, of deep kind of griot style mm -hmm. keepers of old song and then but it was like but that doesn't exist in our country of course you, you know like you know we wouldn't ever have anything that's as tribal as that and then it was like and I heard it and I was like I didn't actively go oh this is this equivalent of which it is but I didn't it's quite hard to make that leap intellectually mm -hmm. if there's nobody else telling you that but actually that's what our music is it's, mm -hmm. it's a very you know, rarefied and unusual version of that, but it is our it's an it's our indigenous song mm. and serves exactly the same purpose. Mm. It's just it's adapted over the centuries, mm. you know, under the influence of church and state and power. <laughs> and a lot of songs about nature as well. Yeah. And and wildlife. Enormous amount um, implicit within them. Um, and are in many ways our the kind of where a lot of that ancient knowledge that is worldwide in t terms of how to connect with your landscape, mm. your land and your species and how, how the songs are not only kind of blueprints of how to di how, how, what, what our love is, but they're also the act of singing them is part of the, uh, it's part of the, it's part of the ritual of being close to them because it's a similarly let's say to uh you know somebody in the in the amazon 
there's a certain purity that comes through, um, whether it's a, a you know a, a traditional um, ikaro, like a ch- spiritual chant that's, mm. that's come traditionally through, to someone that you're talking about, you know, a, a gypsy or whatever, where there's is, isn't a, there's a really there's a purity there. There's someone who lives mm. within nature. Uh, is that right? Yeah, definitely. I think also that. Um, there's there's something that's kind of smuggled away in folk songs, which is, um, is you know they've had to, they've had to shape themselves to evade the suppressions that have gone on, mm. you know. So the 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 atavistic pagan, like tailbones within them are there, but they're invisible, mm. but they're in there, mm. and I think in some ways they've kind of, they hold that same sense of devotion it's there within if you listen to if you were to translate any of these you know prayers for the river Mm. that a indigenous Mm. amazonian um would sing you suddenly realize that actually they're pretty similar in some ways ours have just become a little bit more wordy a little bit more narrative based Mm. less abstract but actually at the heart of them if you whittle down to what the core message is Mm. in them it's generally about love mm-hmm. and love of nature, love of fellow man and woman. Mm. So that's just a lovely uh, summing up of what Kirtan is the other day. Uh, devotional singing. Uh, yeah. Somebody said, you know, if you don't want to understand the words, it's basically, I love you, God, and thank you, and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so my uh, my dad used to we used to go to synagogue as kids and. Uh, my dad would so we'd get there and he'd open the prayer book and you'd see him frowning. Christ, a load of just God groveling. That's what he called it, God groveling, mm. <laughs> which I really liked uh, because it was a appalling form of like relationship to mm. to uh, holiness. And actually, that was part of what I love about folk music, because I realised it's also God groveling, mm. but it's in a much more kind of playful and sensuous way Mm. um, and not so explicit. There's no subtlety within the Mm. kind of Mm. the Jewish Torah. It's just, oh, holy father, mighty Mm. one. It's Mm. it's, it's all about the power, Mm -hmm. empirical power. And within Mm -hmm. folk song, it's this, it's soft power, Mm. (laughs) furry power or feathered Mm. power. And I love the connection with nature as well, that, that there always generally is and... Which maybe brings us to the first cue for a song. Yeah. Um, well, um, you've got your Cora. I do. And we were playing around. And if the... I would just say the reason why I was so pleased you got the Cora is that it comes from a land where a lot of the birds that mm. the best folk songs mm. sing about mm. spend their winters. Mm. So... Um, such as the... Such as the Nightingale. Right. Uh, so we could do a mention that family, the Copper family. Maybe we do one of their songs. Yeah. Try out. This is the great. This is the hymn. This is the hymn for nature. It's the hymn for birds. It's called the birds in the, birds in the spring. I mean, it does what it says on the tin. <laughs> this song, but it really is a kind of beautiful, um, yeah, simple ode to the experience of listening to the dawn chorus. So 
sweet Did you ever hear so sweet Did you ever hear so sweet As the birds in the myself down to view all around and the song of the nightingale echoes all around his notes were so charming his voice so sincere No music, no songster. No music, no songster. Can we? small birds to hear I'll have you pay attention now listen draw near that when you grow old you'll have this to say that you never heard so sweet That you never heard so sweet That you never heard so sweet As the birds in the spring As the birds in the spring So, um, I, uh, it's like that when there's moments uh, where the first time you ever heard the nightingale, mm -hmm. 
maybe there's a song about that the first time you ever heard Nightingale because I was living in Tuscany mm. in Italy at the time and it was I was like it was just absolutely stopped me in my tracks you know just walking down the beautiful lanes at night and then it's like um, firstly the volume um, yeah uh, and I uh, got my, uh, my little DAT recorder at the time. Got some nice recordings uh, hmm. at the time, because of course you didn't you didn't have to go very cl- cl- you know uh, you didn't have to go too close because the the volume. But you so can cool. also they let you come right up to them. I didn't know that at the time. Right. Yeah, but um, would they be like within certain? Are they sort of known as one of the kind of the king of singers of the birds? Is that is that their reputation across the world? Indeed, mm. yeah, mm. they are the principal singer. There is no bird that is featured more within local culture from here in England, which is their most westerly range, all the way over to Western Mongolia, mm. uh, which is their most eastern range, mm. and throughout all the traditions and folk songs and folklore. Every country between those two mm-hmm. uh, domains are nightingale songs, are cultures that have um, appreciated them as being principal birds and keepers of a lot of story. And hence inspired a lot of songs as well. Yeah. The vary in their you know, representation of the bird from different mm-hmm. cultures. I had the great joy in well, writing the book called, that I put out called The Nightingale to go and find all the instances of nightingales in folk mm. song and folk lore as I could. Mm. Um, and it was unbelievable how much, I mean, the book itself could have been a, you know, one of an entire encyclopedia mm. of uh, accounts of how this bird features within different communities. Mm. Yeah. But then I have lots of theories about how this bird has been a, a kind of, a teacher and a kind of musical guide for humans that they they um they winter in uh, in sub-saharan africa our ones in sierra leone senegal um to the western edge of the of their domain and the ones that live in mongolia go to kenya and the eastern side of africa but um if you think about it uh you know as the retreat of the ice sheets and the change in landscape and as humans migrated over the last kind of 100,000 years they have moved out of Africa and adapted the landscape and nightingales depend on the sort of landscape that's kept open by human hand and uh, the the creating of scrub and and, and coppice Mm. which is not a naturally occurring thing without humans there so so there's a relationship with humans in that so story. I suspect they've sort of piggybacked off mankind mm. as on their way up and the, 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 the payment for that ride is that we have learnt our language and our, you know, not just the nightingale, many other birds as well but we've learnt how to um, uh, we've learnt how to use our voices in response, we've always worked with birdsong still do in many communities um, using bird song bird language as a form of communication and understand reading the land the landscape mm. so it's been a very very vital teacher for us without question in terms of how we've become trackers and hunter gatherers using birds as our guides but um, I think the nightingale has always lived very close by to humans and because they allow uh, they're not so scared when, when humans approach. Is that why you did night? No, but and yeah. that's his, and the, and that's was that that did that allow you to do these these concerts? Yeah, I mean that's how it. For those who don't know, maybe uh, uh, tell the audience about. Yeah, uh, tell well, us about that. Um, the amazing thing about their song is that it's most powerful in the spring. Uh, when they arrive in around mid-April, they land. And they instantly start singing, the males start singing their courtship song. And this is that very loud, very rich, evolved, improvised song that's so famous. And they only do it in this country for six weeks. It's longer in the continent because mm. they have two clutches. Mm. Um, but they are, the males are so desperate to be heard mm. by each other as well as the females mm. that they have this kind of resolute 
kind of unflappability and subsequently uh, it's very possible for humans to get very close to the nightingales at night they're protected by being in the middle of very dense blackthorn bushes which are impenetrable so there is a security that they have they kind they're kind of they've, they've found their own cages and they sing so loud but also they're very responsive to human music mm -hmm. so if you start singing or playing instruments they are um they are instantly intrigued not by everyone certain musicians mm. and um are going to an incredible sort of correspondence which is like a collaboration which isn't in an obvious form of collaboration but mm. it is a um it is it's definitely there is enormous amounts of awareness of one to the other well i had a, few, a similar experience in uh Brazil, mm. where the, there was this uh, the sanctuary for parrots, and there was a parrot that had been once living with uh, a family of opera singers who'd been yeah. living in the jungle, <laughs> and I mean, you know, as you know, parrots are extraordinary singers as well. Oh, and, yeah, and, uh, some of the you could tell that it had been living with an opera singer or a family of opera singers. But I did some interactions and did some overtone singing as well. Yeah. Uh, and some flute playing as well. And it was it was fascinating experience. So interesting, it's the overtones that I always start with with the Nightingales. And okay. And really, how do they respond? They love it. It's, their, it's, the, call, it's the calling card. It's a sort of like hmm. they, the, the, the harmonics within overtones just instantly kind of, you can hear them go, oh, What's that sound? Because it's a very pure note tone. Mm. It is pure tone. Yeah. And so are birds in many ways. Mm -hmm. They've got very little of that same harmonic mm. coloration that we have in our voices. So they hear it and they're like, hmm, it sounds like us. I think. <laughs> That's what I think. Mm. No way of knowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, shall we uh, shall we play one of the other songs? Mm. Uh, what was it? Um, maybe we should do the cuckoo. Uh, was that the, the was that the second, second one? Did you one yeah, yeah, in G major. Mm. Thank you. 
If I was a lark And could write a fine hand I'd write my love a letter To him I would send And I'd write my love letter in the unbroken line. And when I think on Bon Claudie, I lose sense of time. When I While drinking strong liquor, the height of my prime. Here's a health to Bon Claudy and the ones I left behind. Here's a health to Bon Claudy. That song um, that has the cuckoo in it, it's a song that comes from, from Ireland, from the Irish travellers, from a woman called Sally Connors, mm. from Bon Clody, actually, who I, mm. was one of the Irish travellers I met in my song collecting journeys, mm. and recorded many amazing songs from her. She's, uh, she was a bit of a gem. Mm. I think she might still be alive even. Mm. And she had that one, which was just such a beautiful ode to the loss of song, both, mm. you know, bird song, but human song, the mm. disappearance. Mm. Mm. Although it wasn't implicitly what the song was about in the first place, it, it just has such uh, a metaphor. It's so analogous to what's going on and the, the kind of evaporation of oral traditions mm. all around the world. Mm. Mm. Um, and the cuckoo theme there is this kind of beast sucking the bird's eggs dry to keep her voice clear mm. had such resonance with this kind of idea of the slightly cannibalistic nature of music today and mm. yeah the, the dog eat dog mm. bird eat bird world mm. that the music is mm. <laughs> actually you reminded me of a uh, um my time in london um some of it i spent uh, playing in a East European folk duo, well, sometimes a trio, uh, and we play in a Polish wine bar in South End Green. And, <laughs> I know uh, the one. You get ready. <laughs> Zamoyski, do you remember yeah, yeah. Zamoyski? Right, okay. Every Friday night or every whenever it was. and uh, uh, But I remember there was a... So we did some... To, to, for the, to please the, uh, the our hosts who ran the place, we did a couple of Polish songs as well, and one was, uh, you might have heard it, it's a, it's a famous Polish folk song about the cuckoo. Oh, right. Um, I don't know if I do. And but, I vaguely yeah. remember the, the, the chorus line, but anyway, it's, it's a cuckoo oh, reference point. Yeah, amazing. It's, well, that's it. These, these birds are as important to the Polish as they are mm -hmm. to, the, mm -hmm. to the English. Mm. Um, it's so nice seeing how the birds appear differently, more forgivingly or more kind of, you know, hauntingly in different songs, mm. Mm. Uh, depending on where they're from. Mm. And also I want to bring up the, um, 
uh, because it's come up a few times the the overtone connection as well. Mm. Uh, so did you did you pick that up on your own or, or did you? Yeah, I I mean I'd heard it being done uh, from Shu Day and Hun Hu too mm. mm. from when I was young with my kind of. Nineteen, I first heard that wonderful real world record of Shude mm. and heard it there and then I just started to give it a go and I had a natural inclination towards it and um, I did I was overtoning before I was singing folks way before I was singing folks oh songs. really okay yeah it kind of predate precedes um, and now I use the overtones within when I gig you know, times well, that. yes, it was it was lovely too when you when you brought that in for a moment uh, um, when I went to see you at the old market in Hove. Mm. Um, it was lovely you you put in a, an overtone moment there. Do you overtone? Yes, I do actually. I, I started in the the, the early eighties. Went to a couple of workshops and, and yeah. then uh, I went to um, uh, I went Who's to spend you? a long weekend with uh, a very interesting, wonderful gong and overtone teacher in uh, the mountains above Lucerne called Bernard Jaeger. Oh yes. You heard of Bernard Jaeger? I think so. Does he yodel as well? I don't remember any yodeling okay, going on. Maybe but, another but, uh, but, but um he, he had a it was just to, you know when it's like sometimes you just need that little bit of extra input just to get you to mm. the next level. And it was just what I needed. That was just sometime in the nineties. Um but it was the setting as well because it was a converted monastery and he's got a his wife was from Bhutan, so you've yeah. it was, and it was had to be snowing that weekend. So it was just <laughs> it was just all but it was just so it's but I love the links as well. Mm. And I love the way you brought in the Mongolian connection as well and with the, the link with the nightingale and um um actually I wonder maybe we can have a, an overtone moment. I'd love that. Okay. Do you do the the overtone or the like the humi, the low I I don't do the traditional humi. Good. No, right. no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> no, no. Well, that's perfect. <laughs> so, should we just should we just have an uh, overtone impro? Yeah. Okay. Who so, makes the note? Well, um, you sometimes note? the way I do it when there's a fellow overtone singer mm. is we just we just go one, two, three, and in. Okay. Should we try that? Mm. Okay. And just see where it goes. Yeah. Okay. Like uh, like a breath and then. Yeah. Okay. Second technique you did there after the interview. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can wait that long. <laughs> oh. oh, it's so great doing it with somebody else. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, yes. Yeah. So powerful. Yes. <gasps> yeah. Well, let's start a choir. Yeah, <laughs> the only time choir. <laughs> so, um, uh, so eventually, you started. Just to sort of fill, just to fill in the story a bit more, mm. you literally travelled around uh, the Isles of Albion, the British <laughs> Isles, 
uh, collecting. Um, did that just kind of just naturally you just started and then it just then it turned into a whole thing of its own? Well, there were many ways that it kind of came about. So obviously I was listening to these old singers and every, you know and each one of them died, you know nineteen this nineteen that. And uh, and all the academics and all the librarians are there. Like, oh no, no, all the all the source singers have, have, have passed away. And then I, um, through chance, got in contact with a man called Peter Kennedy, who was once the president of the Folk Song Society, uh, and was the BBC sound recordist and song collector, the most prolific of the British ones on reel to reel. That is. Mm not quite as much as Cecil Sharp himself who noted by hand everything with only a little bit of sound recording when it first when it finally came out but Peter Kennedy was the man who worked with Alan Lomax when Lomax mm-hmm. was went into exile and came to, uh, to Britain and joined the BBC and they created radio programs together so they traveled all around and um, and Peter Kennedy was a very old man at the time and I um got chatting and offered my, you know, some voluntary services and I didn't know really much about it and went to meet him in in Gloucester, where he lived, and spent a week with him sort of telling me his stories of song collecting and out in the field. Now, it must be said that he was a person whose sort of behaviour and moral uh, sort of stance on song collecting was pretty appalling. And every rule that there ever could be about how to do, you know, sound work in the field, sensitive, respectful, non-exploitative work, he broke. <laughs> he was a very corrupt man in many ways. I didn't realise this until afterwards. But he was the one who kind of turned me, my attention to the act of song collecting. And I was enthralled. But there was one critical moment where he played me a recording of a gypsy girl singing an old folk song and I realised that this was recorded in 1954 or 1955 and she must have been about 10 years old and it was 2005 and I was like well wait a minute she's probably in her 70s now which means she could still be alive and could remember so I then was like driving along one day out in the west country and um, and saw a gypsy traveller site and just was like to go in and ask if they know I was so obsessed with this idea and I'd read all the books and stories by this point of and knew all the songs to go and see if they knew any songs and to cut a long story short they didn't but they told me somebody who did who then told me somebody else who did and and I suddenly I found myself bit by bit going in and realizing that actually this is where I wanted to learn my songs from I was going and that developed as a project into what became the song collectors collective and an organization that kind of funded a journey of projects creating a digital archive and training people up to record and education projects mm. and trying to record as much of the last elders who were remembering these songs from the uh, English gypsies, Irish travellers and then the Scottish travellers which was my next kind of big, big journey which happened kind of around the same time of becoming apprentice to the last of the Scottish travellers this guy called Stanley Robertson and he was um, a phenomenal ballad singer and storyteller of a whole other order not of a kind of somebody who remembered a few things but was kind of dipped in the cauldron of folk song and folklore from a community that although almost disappeared had maintained a kind of high voltage of the stuff as it were and was a very deeply spiritual you know he's a kind of the equivalent of a zen master Mm very psychic mm. lived in on another plane constantly connected to the ancestors and um was in the four and a bit years that i was with him uh of whose ring i wear was initiated properly into the kind of the act of what singing means which was where i became a singer mm. as he introduced me to this idea of what the spiritual kind of responsibility was and how would you sum that up if you could. Hmm, how did I sum that up? That when you're singing, you're never alone. You're always, you're, you're bringing the ancestors with you. Does it depend on what you're singing? Hmm, yes, when you're singing the old songs, you are. But I think what they do is they give you the capacity by them being the training ground that then whatever you sing, 
you are st standing on their shoulders mm -hmm. and you have got that the power of song the responsibility is to honor what they have brought in the in the in way of their both repertoire but also what they've lived to 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 bring to us as in the hardship they've gone through and what the songs meant and that that the way that songs held a place of such power for the elders that you can never sing without that being present so it's a sort of like an accountability and it's a sense of responsibility and duty that one has as a singer to always be you know behaving in and singing with purpose and intent and awareness of what the gift is that you have that's i think i just can how i can sum it up I, I, yeah that's uh, that sums it up really well and the link with other indigenous communities that are connected to to the land all mm. over the world mm. yeah and that some places still have that mm. clarity and the well runs really clear mm. and and bubbles you know bubbles up beautifully and we can all drink from it some places it's dried up, but it's but, always there. But also, in, in, in I, I was going to Scotland quite regularly mm. and uh, um, uh, for a certain while and, and really managed to get a lot of inspiration from just being on the land there because mm. it's, it's, so, cause it's so strong, uh, the spirit up there, and especially up in the highlands and places okay. like that. So it's no surprise, really, uh, that the, all these songs should bubble up. Mm. such a place totally and, and part of the training was not just sitting and learning songs it was about going to the place where the songs had come from mm. to the bit on that on the D, D side of the river D or you know the, this glen or this valley mm. or this ruin sometimes we were going to find the ruins mm. you know one of the old the biggest of the, all the songs the middle of Tifti's Annie um, you know going to find that very mill from, you know, from six, seven hundred years ago. And, 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 and is, did you feel the significance of that when you went to these places, the origins of the song? Oh my God, yeah. I mean, it was just like... So it was almost was like you made the, the link with the song and it, it just became, got to another level or another mm. depth. Is that, was that your experience? Yeah, the song, you could never, you could never not know the song. The song was when you've gone to the place where it's come from and you've, You've been told the names of the people who've sung it going back for 150 years mm. and where where the, the camping grounds were of the travellers mm. and looking at that that kind of living archaeology when I, and that kind of spiritual psychogeography of how it exists in situ, they just like, these songs suddenly are like enormous mm. and, you know, big vital things that you need to yeah um you need to look after and what a privilege to sing them so i became obsessed with them because they were like it was like you know finding superpowers yeah well, Each, finding jewels is like a yeah and also the the link with the we're talking about traveling and the community that tr moves around a lot mm. as well I mean, i'm thinking about the song lines Mm. With the, uh, the the Aborigines in Australia, there's a lot of movement as well, isn't there? Mm. As there always has been with everyone, and I think that mm. song has always been been part of that part of the landscape and, and understanding the landscape and the passing the knowledge on. So although we don't have a song line tradition, we do have concepts. I call it song dreaming. Um, of how songs have been used as part of that activation that penetration into the land mm. um, and as somebody who'd grown up you know when I, before folk music in wilderness work and nature studies and I survival as it was called mm. back in the day in mm. bushcraft mm. and taught and led nature connection and kind of land based crafts and arts and suddenly realising these songs were like the most powerful way in it was like you know that moment when you learn how first how to do fire by friction mm. and then you realise every piece of wood has got fire in it the potential to create fire it's magic when you when you start hearing folk songs coming from the land you realize every bit of land has got song in it we just you just not every necessarily every bit of land has the technology to 
divine to, to, to pump that, yeah, to prospect that song out, mm. as it were. So, but it, may, it suddenly opens up what relating to the land is, because it then becomes a real joy of having music as your, yeah, as your kind of tuning rods, your divining forks, and your yeah, ways of connecting in again. A new way to a new way to relate to land as well mm. to the land. Yeah, and for the land to speak to you. That's it. It's a, it's as much an act of uh, expression as it is about listening. Mm. It's one of Stanley's kind of great teachings. Just how how you listen in, mm -hmm. use of silence, how you create the space. Which is the beautiful thing about the unaccompanied mm. tradition mm -hmm. is that when one sings an unaccompanied song, there's loads of space. And the orchestration is all there, mm. and you can hear it in there. But you can also hear a lot more than that, mm. the other voices behind you, and that's, I think, a, a beautiful aspect of the, the British style. Mm. Time for a song? Mm. Um, do one more? Let's, uh, yeah, there's one more. Um. <laughs> I know what I was playing. <laughs> So we've been doing the three birds. They've done the nightingale, the cocoon, and the other bird that migrates to this land where this was grown. Basically making the connection with this instrument, which is the kora, mm. which comes from countries such as Senegal, Mali, Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, um, Mali, um, so which is where mm. the birds migrate to. So this, Listeners, if you haven't worked out what the other bird is, the holy trinity of birds is the turtle dove. Oh 
open yonder does say that little turtle dog He does sit on yonder high tree And making his time for the loss of his love And I So we've we've, um, we've we've covered the the trinity of <laughs> of the birds. Mm. And there are a few other birds too we left out, but you know you can't sing them all. No, no, no. no but um, uh, so I'm I'm definitely more the wiser <laughs> than many many different ways through this interview. So and um, so in terms of uh, what you put out recently, there's the, there's the book. Mm-hmm. Um, which is called it's called the Nightingale Notes on a Songbird. And it's a sort of biography of the bird and also my journeys with it and experiences and how the bird re- relates to extinction, the the kind of climate crisis, ecological crisis, and how it sits as a sort of figurehead for our our own kind of emotional and spiritual decline as well. The separation from us and this bird and nature as a whole kind of yeah go hand in hand and you um uh and also it, in terms of um interpretation the subject mm. of interpretation uh, it was fascinating to explore some of your um recent albums and just just how you've interacted that and weaved in these songs into kind of a modern production mm. was that again was that intentional as well mm, very much yeah the I mean for me these songs can't stay the same as they have done you know once you've put an instrument to them you've broken it out of its you know traditional way um, so if anything it has to keep moving they have to keep evolving as they always have done to survive um, they are only snapshots of the time in which you're listening to them we can only know what they sound like up to about 150 years ago when the first people started documenting them and mm. writing them down. Mm. That journey of evolution must continue, otherwise they will be consigned to the, uh, to the sort of, you know, mm. the second-hand discount price bin, mm. uh, literally, as well as, <laughs> as uh, like, you know, spiritually. Um, so they need to be reappraised and challenged. It's what we need to do with them and adapt. And they're pretty strong stuff, made of pretty strong stuff, these folk songs. So I feel like they can handle lots of abuse and lots of experimentation. Sometimes they come out better for them. Mm. And so, uh, what was the so? What's the last album you put out? So that's called Old Wow. And um, it's a song that charts in three chapters, heart, hearth and earth. Mm. And that's songs of the heart, songs of the hearth, the community and of the earth, of nature. Um, Yeah, my most, I feel like my finest bit of work yet is that album. 
Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of songs that I wrote as well, it re reinterpreted the narrative or adapted the lyrics mm. and the tunes in many places to make them kind of contemporary retellings of old. And also, I love the the way you've you've also working with voices as well, it, which is uh, uh, something uh, uh, and it's very good for me to hear um, mm. as I, do, I work a lot with voices and doing voice work. And so you've got the Nest Collective as well, mm. and you've got a choir as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I mean, many things. The Nest Collective is the uh, overall my events company within that. We have the fire choir, we have the scene with Nightingale's concerts over spring. Then we have the campfire club season, which is about 80 concerts around the country in different cities, mostly London, also Brighton, mm -hmm. um, Bristol, Sheffield, Manchester, somewhere else as well, I can't remember, Coventry. Um, and concerts around the campfire every week with mm -hmm. world and traditional music and acoustic artists. And, and the two festivals a year and our... Audio, uh, artistic development program, a huge array of different things that we do, a lot of working with different communities and um, yeah, bringing music to unusual places, a pilgrimage strand of nature walks with music, singing to the land, the turtle dove pilgrimage and the salmon pilgrimage, mm -hmm. all of which happen in June. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a vast program. We did more events over 2021, 2021 then. Mm -hmm. I think anyone else did about 120 events mm. around the country, which for a live music events company is pretty radical because mm -hmm. a lot of it's outdoors, so mm -hmm. we can do it. Mm -hmm. So it's a prolific organisation that mm -hmm. I sort of founded about 16 years ago and we've got a really good team who see it out. Mm -hmm. and we're trying to keep going, you know, mm -hmm. under unusual circumstances, oh, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. it's definitely something that's needed, more nature mm -hmm. music put together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Because I ended on an advert. <laughs> well, it's, you know, uh, it's important as part of the story of each artist that, yeah. uh, well, <laughs> what it, you know, what's actually happening. Um, what about we go out with uh, the humming version of the, uh, oh, yeah. of the Nightingale? That'd be lovely. Okay. You create music for the credits. <laughs> yes. Start rolling them up. <laughs>
Thank you, Abby. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>